Hello and welcome to Keep Talking, a community dialogue about mental health. My name is Gay Maxwell and I'm the manager of the Office of Continuing Education at the Brattleboro Retreat. The Brattleboro Retreat is a 184-year-old psychiatric and addictions treatment hospital located in southeastern Vermont. It serves adults, adolescents, and children in a variety of outpatient, inpatient, and partial hospitalization programs. The Brattleboro Retreat provides care and courage when being human hurts. Today in the BCTV studio, I am absolutely thrilled that I have as our guest Martha B. Strauss, PhD. Um, Dr. Strauss is actually a resident of Brattleboro, I'm thrilled to say, and I th so I thought this is about time that we get her on Keep Talking. She's a professor of in the Department of Clinical Psychology at Antioch University. Um, she's the author of numerous books, five books, count them, five, um, uh, which include No Talk Therapy for Children and Adolescents, Adolescent Girls in Crisis, Intervention and Hope, and most recently, Treating Traumatized Adolescents, Development, Attachment, and a Therapeutic Relationship. Welcome, Dr. Strauss. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to see you. Delightful to be here. <laughs> you will be very soon, actually June 8th, um, will be presenting at the Office of Continuing Education back at, at the Brattleboro, retreat. back at the retreat. You've been there several times before. Um, and you will be presenting on treating traumatized adolescents and how to stay unhooked. So I thought this would be a great time to talk about uh, for our studio audience about parenting the adolescent and how do parents keep from getting hooked by their um, adolescent children. So first of all, I'll just start off with, a, with asking you, I, uh, I certainly know this from my own experience, teenagers can be enraging, they can also be absolutely hilarious, they can be really mean, they can be loving and warm, they can be the greatest company in the world, and they can also suck the serenity right out of a household within 10 seconds flat. So to begin, why is that? That's the question on the tips of every parent's tongue, isn't it? I, I can answer that, and I, I will quickly. Um, people usually know the answer to that. Uh, the brain is changing rapidly, hormones are raging, the expectations bar goes up, monitoring goes down. It's a perfect storm for all kinds of volatility uh, that are to be expected because their neurology and their biology and the social environment is changing so rapidly. Um, I don't think that's as interesting a question as the one that I wish you'd ask. What, what's the question you want to <laughs> um, be asked? We know that it's a time of great change and drama for adolescents. Anyone that lives with an adolescent knows that. Why not ask, how come they get to us the way they do? How come um, we get so easily triggered? If you understand that this is them just doing their job, this is the way it is, which I think there's a lot of wisdom and brain information out there now to understand that. How come we're not looking at ourselves and understanding or taking the opportunity, um, thinking about it even as an opportunity, to uh, explore what our own triggers are? And how come when my kid swears at me, I get so activated by that? I just get furious. I see red, you know? What is that? And maybe getting to know ourselves better and learning how to comfort ourselves better and understanding our triggers would keep a escalating situation from getting so red hot. Mm -hmm. So there, there are some things that you must see parents having a hard time grasping uh, that you feel like they need to start working on grasping. Yeah, I think that uh, we focus on why is my teenager uh, being so awful and unpredictable or somebody do something, you know, fix this. And um, I like to think of it as a maybe more usefully as a reframe for um, how do I, what I have control over, right, is my own behavior and my own self-awareness and capacity for understanding what's going on. So how do I turn this around into uh, figuring out why I get so uh, hooked and engaged and caught up in this storm? Because we now know, studies show, uh, that if you get emotionally engaged and get really upset, the it, discussion does not calm down. I don't know if you've noticed that as a parent, right? <laughs> I certainly have. You know, we participate so readily in the escalation. Mm -hmm. So I'm very curious with parents about what their uh, 
job is in there and how they understand what they could do differently um, to keep it calmer. So this must be a direction that you take in your private practice with families. I'm, um, st I'm just wondering uh, when uh, families do come in your office, or maybe just parents by themselves, what are the presenting problems that often parents walk in with? I would say there are kind of two general uh, reasons that families, there's others too, but the two general um, causes of families coming into, my, into a private practice are uh, anxiety of some kind, um, it might be anxiety that runs in the family, but with all the extra stress of adolescence, it's uh, the teenager is in greater distress, and it might have uh, uh, depression or other kinds of um, issues attendant to that, but anxiety is certainly a have focus. Have you seen anxiety growing yeah, in your process, I think in, your, it, in your practice? I think it does. I think, I think anxiety seems to be in the air these days more, certainly in a private practice audience, mm -hmm. audience mm -hmm. a private practice Mm -hmm. um, group of clients mm -hmm. that they seem to be more parents are more anxious about their kids, which is why they would be referring them also. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other uh, maybe related kind of a referral reason is communication. What one thing that seems very striking is that parents find out something about their teenager that they didn't know to be true. They've discovered they're self harming or that they're suicidal or they're engaging in other kinds of antisocial or self-destructive behavior. And they're pretty freaked out because they thought they knew the kid and then suddenly they realize there's this big chasm of communication. They want to make it better. Mm -hmm. So uh, what are the three common mistakes that you think that parents make? Uh, in, it, it can be around anxiety, it can be around communication. Wh what are those, the mistakes that you um, see happening over and over again in your practice? Okay, so one is letting go too soon. It's sort of the opposite. I mean, sometimes when we're anxious, uh, we get the message from the universe, the, the community, and the culture mm -hmm. that the problem is that we're um, hovering too much or we're too anxious and um, we're not letting them be autonomous enough. And so um, a serious problem to me is that parents are letting go too soon. It's kind of the opposite of what the popular uh, press is saying about adolescents. I think that uh, one big area is that parents don't know whether they should be holding on or letting go or how much to monitor. And so one uh, broad umbrella problem area is uh, parents not hanging in enough. And uh, when at the end of a successful therapy, I go around the room asking people, including the adolescent, what made this successful? Uh, the adolescent invariably says something like, my parents didn't give up on me, they didn't let go, they persisted even when I told them to get out of my face. And um, so I think that that's one big um, general kind of problem area, that parents are not understanding that even if the adolescent is indicating to the contrary, that they really still need their parents to, Because to be oftentimes there. when uh, one has an adolescent, you're getting the pushback a lot, so uh, it, it, it's normal <laughs> yeah. to have a, a, well, okay, I'll, I'll uh, uh, lay off, you know, right. I, I won't get as involved. So. And so that ties into the second uh, problem, which is that parents take it very personally. One of the most important uh, s struggles that I work with is, you know, encouraging parents, giving them the courage to uh, not take it so personally and to understand the teenagers doing their job by being obnoxious and you're doing your job by not giving up. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's sort of the second um, area. And then the third thing is even uh, more interesting to me uh, in terms of the anxiety that I'm treating in families, which is that parents, part of the reason we want our kids to behave well and feel well is that we love them and we'd like them to feel successful. And that's all well and good. But another reason we do this is because we want to feel better. And it's very dysregulating and upsetting and distressing for us when our kids are upset. When they're upset, that upsets us. And in some ways, we put a lot of pressure, added pressure on kids who are already not managing that well to help us feel better. And so the third problem area that I work with families a lot and parents a lot is to unburden the kids with being responsible for the way the parent feels. And so uh, if a child or an adolescent is upset or angry, they get to have those feelings, right? We don't have to rush in and fix it. 
It's not, I mean, necessarily, and we get so activated, like, oh no, they're upset, we have to go do something. And what's really happening is because we're empathic is that we get upset too. We're feeling their pain as if it's our own, which is what empathy is, and good parents do that. But then we kind of take it on as something we have to squelch or fix. Or fix. And that communicates to them that they can't tolerate it either, that there's something wrong with them, that their job is to take care of us. And so I, I work with parents to kind of back off in that emotional way while staying uh, a actively engaged and loving. Mm -hmm. You referred um, a, a little while ago about teenagers have to do their job. I mean, there's their job that they're trying to do in this stage. And so I'm wondering, um, it, so often in the relationship uh, as parent and uh, a teenager, you're, you end up butting heads. Is the head butting part of that, of them doing their job? And um, uh, what are the steps or um, what are the steps that parents can do to avoid uh, stepping into that, it, stepping into the drama, not taking it personally. Um, it's so easy to, f to get your feelings hurt. Right, it sure is. Uh, they're really up in our grill, to use their language mm -hmm. a little bit. My kids used to talk like that, you're up in my grill, <laughs> get out of my grill. <laughs> but you know, um, that's their job. I think one of, the, one of the things I say developmentally as a developmental psychologist is that argumentativeness is a developmental attainment, is a milestone. Mm -hmm. And having raised teenagers, I know that that's cold comfort <laughs> to parents when they're um, you know, being yelled at by their kid. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, uh, it's a sign that argument, arguing is a sign that the adolescent brain is growing and changing because in order to make a good argument, you have to have perspective taking and uh, some new skill, it's like a new toy, having a bigger brain, mm -hmm. a more expansive brain that can consider different perspectives and options. And, um, you know, it drives parents nuts. But uh, that is them doing their job. Mm -hmm. And you probably have to develop a very good sense of humor if you don't have one already. <laughs> well, this, this sense of humor comes attendant to uh, being self-reflective and self-aware. Mm -hmm. So I usually tell parents there are three things you got to learn to do, and I teach it too, and then we practice it. And believe me, there's endless opportunities for practice, right? <laughs> but the first is to understand what's getting you hooked, what the triggers are. So ahead of time, you have an idea that when the, we have these kinds of fights, which we have over and over again, the place where I get hooked is when they start yelling at me or walking away or whatever it is, we're provoked by people, it's idiosyncratic, we're all provoked by different things. I never minded my kids swearing at me so much. What I didn't like is when they said whatever and left the room, I didn't like that, it was very provocative to me because I wanted to keep processing. You know, so everybody has different hooks, but I, to know what your hooks are ahead of time is advantageous because when you're about to get hooked, you're going, oh, I can feel, I mean, sometimes I say one to 10, you know, yeah, I can have a really good conversation with my kid when we are like below a six in my, how distressed I am. And we now know, research shows us, if your pulse is over 80, only garbage comes out of your mouth. So there is some amount, and a one to 10, like say seven or eight, whatever it is, if you're at that level of distress yourself, you gotta take a time out. And then when you're not at an eight anymore, and you want, you're ready to come back and try again, it might be interesting to learn about apologizing and repairing. Yeah. Um, and that isn't to apologize for the whole way the conversation turns south, but that I got upset or um, I overreacted or I got so worried, I got triggered, however people want to say it. When I travel around and give talks, I always ask, how many of your parents apologized to you when you were coming up? A room of 100 people, 200 people. At the most, 10% of people raised their hands. We have astonishing little, little practice with apology and asking for forgiveness and repair when there has been a rupture. So after you calm back down again and you want to start again, you can say, I'm really sorry for what I did that made this escalate the way it did. I'd love to have a better conversation with you. Can we try again? And uh, sometimes adolescents apologize too and they go, yeah, I'm sorry also, uh, you know, that got out of hand. And they're, you know, it's a practice. Well, it's such important modeling. Right. It's uh, that it's 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 such important modeling in terms of, um, I can, uh, you know, it's okay to be wrong. It's okay to be human. It's okay to be imperfect. And take responsibility for what you have responsibility for, because it's a two-person escalation usually. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and that repairs and brings back uh, a calm interaction or the potential for one. So are you saying that the old adage, pick your battles, that that's still a, a pretty good piece of advice? Yeah. Um, I have kind of a twist on that. I want twist to go back away. to it. So the first thing is knowing what your hooks are. Um, the second is kind of a picking battles, but is also stating your intentions ahead of time and even stating them out loud. Because what we find is that people get lost in the argument. They start dredging up other stuff and they're all upset that it helps right at the start. This is what I want to have come out of this conversation. I can see we're about to have a conflict. I mean, people can do this. Even It's amazing. If you'd set the stage beforehand, not once you're at an eight, right? But so the first thing is know what your triggers are. And then second is to set the intention. And the intention is I will have a conversation with you about this. But And at the end, what I hope is that you can have a later curfew that night. And also, we have a plan for how you're going to get your homework and chores done. Something like that. So the intention is stated. And um, that keeps the focus on whether the conversation is heading that way or not. And then the third is that time out, taking a time out if you get too upset and trying again. So the idea would be to know whether you want to have the fight or not, or even go into it. So um, rather than pick your battles, I like this idea of Ross Green has three baskets. And the first basket, I always say to parents, no is a complete sentence. And in the first basket, it's health and safety. It's stuff that you, why negotiate about it? Why have a prolonged conflict about it? The answer is no. And I tell families, we talk about the three baskets, so everyone knows. When parents say, this is a basket one, I'm not having this conversation, you can say, I'm sorry, I know this is really important to you, but the answer is no, and that's the end. Mm -hmm. We don't have to con converse about it. I'm going to skip to basket three. Basket three is big. It's the biggest one. It's all the things you're willing to let go of in the name of sanity and harmony. Um, I sometimes have school consequences for school. If the kid's not doing their homework, why is that my problem? Make this, you know, have the school have a school <laughs> consequence for that, um, and I work with the school to do that, mm -hmm. right? Um, room clean, clean rooms. I'm, I don't like the dirty dishes in the room so much. I might still have that be a basket one, but you know, anyway, come up with stuff that we've been bickering about that I don't care. So you stay up a half an hour later. I don't care. Do you actually make lists with your yeah, clients? They yeah, they can. They can do that. Is that, that a helpful thing for people to do? To say, ooh, that goes in back. You know, right? Sit, I have parents down. come in and say, let's. What did you fight about this week? What can, and help them divvy it up. And basket two is where you're going to compromise and negotiate and have a conversation. Because we want these adolescents to learn how to speak up for themselves and to have a civilized conversation, make their case, and learn how to uh, accept responsibility and perspective taking and like why, what I would object to about this if I were the parent. Mm -hmm. So we practice that. And that's really good. Family therapy uh, helps with that um, as parents are learning how to do that. And I always tell parents, if it gets hot button and the adolescent uh, starts screaming and swearing, it can go be a basket one. And that can be very incentivizing. So it's, it's, it's moved on to uh, pick your battles, actually pick your basket. Pick your basket. Pick your basket. OK. Right. All right, we got that clear. <laughs> and pick your basket and have everyone know which basket it is, right? Mm -hmm. And then also, the problem with pick your battles, I have one other issue with it, right? Which is that um, a lot of parents think that means that I don't have to engage as much with my adolescent. I'm not going to deal with this. And I think the disengagement actually, for a lot of families, escalates the conflict when it happens because it becomes the point of contact and intimacy and intensity. So it's kind of paradoxical. It's very passionate, this arguing. And if there isn't a lot of other uh, connectivity, it becomes kind of the point of uh, intimate connectivity, even if it's aversive for everybody. Mm -hmm. So pick your battles or pick your baskets, but also find opportunities to notice that we used to catch them being good, you know? Just have normal conversations. Say, I'm going to, you know, get order a pizza. What kind do you want? Or I don't know, keep it going, you know, keep in engaged. the positive way, right? Yeah, keep engaged. Okay, so if you, um, I'm, I'm curious about the difference between what would be normal emotionality, uh, normal reactivity, and then wondering about, is this a red flag? Is something up with my kid? Um, how does a parent know the difference between uh, on that continuum somewhere when they need help? Great question. Uh, one of the things that, having been in this 
game for so long, I've discovered over time, is that it's very unusual for a parent to seek out help um, and to be fretful about their teen for no reason at all. So I, th I like to think of parents really as the local expert on their adolescent, not me. And so if a parent will say, I don't know if this is abnormal or how bad this is, but I'm, I have that feeling you know, in my gut that there's something not OK here. She seems different to me than the kid I knew, or he's acting uh, more distressed more of the time. He's sleeping all the time. Something that seems sort of red flaggish, doesn't it? Um, I say, well, why don't we meet? Why don't I, we do like a couple of times and see, and I'll let you know what I think. And sometimes. Uh, I meet with the teen a couple of times, and I think this kid's doing pretty well. And we meet with the parent to reassure the parent together and to discuss what the red flags really would be and um, to encourage the parent to continue to be attentive. The other thing is if a parent's beginning to be a little disconcerted and they have community, if they have uh, neighbors or extended family or friends, parents, you know, uh, who are seeing your kid in a a different context at their house, mm -hmm. um, or it's guidance counselors or the coach, to have people, other adults' eyeballs in the natural community on them, ahead of you know, making a call to a professional and shelling out money. Mm -hmm. um, and even if those people haven't seen anything, their eyeballs are now on, and they're more alerted to what your concerns are. So there's more people. Um, uh, watching your adolescent. But my overall, I, mostly when we worry about our kids, there's something to worry about. Uh, really, most, nine times out of 10. Uh, because people, if you're, if you're adult, we're wired to be able to do this, right? Over you know, millennia, right? right? So that if there's something off that we're feeling, there is something off. So we have to learn, parents have to be more trusting of their own radar, I think, on this. Uh, in the media these days, or maybe in the last 20 years, certainly in the time that I have been a parent um, raising children and adolescents, they're young adults now, so that's a relief. <clears throat> but um, uh, you hear the expression doormat parenting, that, that parenting, uh, that we've, uh, we're a generation of, of doormats as far as parenting goes. Uh, is, is that, does that feel true to you? I'm so sick of this. Con I'm, it's not you. I'm sick of the, the doormat. I'm sick of the helicopter. You know, it's really hard to find the sweet spot because people blame parents for being inattentive and self-involved and um, allowing their kids to, you know, run amok or being too worried or letting the kids. I mean, it's really you hard. For you losing. can't win for losing, and it's usually moms. So I'm particularly sensitive to that blame, and I'm not understanding what the concern really is. So are we afraid? Are we fearful for our kids? Yeah. There's a lot to be worried about, right? Mm -hmm. um, I have a, a woman that I treated uh, over a period of time. And she had a 16-year-old son who had been uh, beaten up by his drunken dad and then abandoned when the guy moved out of the house. And um, the kid had some run-ins with the law. And she was beside herself. And people said she's a doormat because she's not setting firm enough limits with this out of control child that she was terrified for, and maybe of too, but really worried. The kid could go back to jail again. She was beside herself. Is she a doormat? I don't think so. I think she was an overwhelmed, petrified single parent with a lot of people passing judgment on her and on what she was doing. And she needed more support. So I don't, I don't like thinking about that. I think that we're, we're worried and trying to protect our kids. I want to, I don't know if for time, but I want to say there was a MacArthur study done that um, has nice language to it. They studied sort of emerging adulthood, the transition from adolescence to adulthood. And they divided this big national sample into swimmers, treaders, and sinkers, um, looking at why some kids did really well and others kind of held place and some really sank like a stone. So what was the thing that the, we all want to have swimmers, right, in that? And the swimmers had really involved parents. Mm -hmm. That was the hallmark of the swimmer. The parents knew what the kids were about. They were paying attention. They were involved. They were engaged. 
I, they weren't, I don't know, I don't know the languaging, the di disparaging languaging doormat or helicopter. I don't know. It doesn't seem useful to me. It seems more media sensationalist. Mm -hmm. So, so that um, I, I I think that's really interesting. The 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 whole concept. That's what you keep coming back to over and over again in your answers. Is parents need to stay engaged with their kids, no, even when the engagement is. Um, uh, uh, not the most fun. <laughs> Nicely <laughs> put. Not the most fun, yes. It's a, night, um, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare sometimes, but you're still engaged. They're still uh, hanging around to, to, to hook you. Um, and, and that in some ways the hooking can even be a compliment. <laughs> yeah, they're <laughs> that still they want to have a relationship with you. I would rather have an angry, um, up in the grill kid than a kid who has given up and is disengaged and doesn't believe that their parents are gonna be there to respond to them every time. Give me the up in the grill kid who's engaging and trying. There's someone in there worth fighting for. Mm -hmm. We've gotta work on their style. We like their spirit in a way because we don't wanna send more shut up people out into the women out into the world, people out in the world. We like people to speak up for themselves and to learn to do it well. And uh, parents are, for better or for worse, where they sharpen their teeth to, to learn how to manage uh, intimate conflict. Would you say that parents are more afraid of their children these days? Than a generation ago? Yes. Um, well, we're fearful for the, our kids, too. I don't know. We're afraid of a lot of things. We're afraid of leaving them uh, a world that we're not going to be able to protect them, you know, because we're going to be long gone. We're afraid that... Uh, we haven't done it as well as whatever the media says we're supposed to do, even though we love them so very much. Um, we're afraid that, you know, it's all going to be our fault if something bad happens. So I'm afraid of them. I'm, I think it's more just fearful that this is such a uh, perilous world out there to be raising kids into. And we want to do it well. Yes. Um, so this is a fearful world for um, uh, our children. Uh, it, it, more so than it was perhaps for us when we were coming of age. How do parents model hope and resilience um, when the world feels fearful and we're bombarded um, by fear media? Um, I guess I'm saying the same thing over and over again. That's I feel okay. like I have only one, one message, but I think it's such a deep message too about engagement. I, one of the things I believe about evolution is that we are wired to live in communities, uh, probably about 30 people, communities, extended family and uh, social networks, and people are really isolated. We, were not e we have not evolved to be a single parent with a hellion teenager trying to do it and work full time and do it all by yourself. So um, part of the message is that we need community we, social isolation makes everything worse. And in order for us to be resilient and to model how to be brave and courageous and live uh, fully, we have to have social support ourselves and we have to be, live in community and stay connected and understand that across the lifespan, uh, the thing that is most healing for people is connection to people that know them and love them. Yes. Well, so I think don't that let go. Your well, that's that's really what I'm hearing. Your message is today: don't let go, stay engaged, uh, ask for help when you need it from people who might be able to help you, which is another way of stay in community, model community. Th those are all the things that seem to be really important, even when it may be a really volatile <laughs> relationship. That kid is still trying to stay connected in the Absolutely. in the in the conflict. in the way they know how in the way they know how. Thank you so much, Martha, for joining me today. Thank and, you so much. Um, it's just uh, for taking the time and uh, and really um, uh, talking about um, how we can really stay engaged with our kids and feel and also feel good about our parenting. Um, that engagement is good, and that we're we're all trying the best we possibly can. We are all trying the best we can. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you for joining us once again on Keep Talking, a community dialogue about mental health. And thank BCTV, who helps us put these to programs together. I, again, I couldn't do it without them. They are magnificent. And I hope you'll join us again uh, on another episode of Keep Talking. Thanks. Thanks.